Trashomaniacs. Thanks for joining us for Geo Gearheads Beta 41 as we talk with WV Tim about gadget caches. I'm the bad cop. With Daryl W4, and next week we'll have Jeep in Idaho to talk about uh, gear for your off road vehicle. We always encourage you to call in your questions, comments, or feedback, and we have one of those called in for the bad cop to tackle right now. Hi there, Cash Max. This is Macy Ducey from the great Northwest near Seattle. I have a question. Uh, we were talking about uh, paperless caching here a while back. Bad Cop talked about using the geocaching uh, app to save the uh, uh, search and all the uh, uh, data points on a, a map. Um, I was wondering what version he was using or if he was using the iPhone because uh, when I do it, I can only save the one particular uh, uh, data point for a geocache uh, at a time. I can save it to a group of files, but I can only save one. I can't save the 20 or 30 that pop up if uh, I put something specifically. I was wondering how he did that, or maybe I was mistaken what I heard. Appreciate any kind of answer. Thanks. Well, AC Ducey, thank you. I love getting calls from the great Northwest. Now, we covered this way back in beta episode 36. So, what was that, six episodes ago? Um, and here's the steps I laid out for the iOS or the iPhone version of the app. Uh, you tap the Find Nearby Geocaches button, click the map icon, and then you can zoom and move the map to wherever you want to start searching. Tap Search and choose New Search from here. After that, tap Back and then hit the save icon. It looks like a little diskette. You type in the list name and save for offline use. And if you use OpenStreetMaps, you'll be able to download a street map and a topo map tile to use offline. Now that's on the uh, iOS version of the app, mm -hmm. and it's a little bit more confusing on Android, but it does work in basically the same way. I was using the now current version on uh, a device that's actually technically not compatible, which is the uh, Asus Google uh, Nexus 7. Uh, it's actually made by Asus, even though it's sold by Google, blah, blah, blah. But in any case, it's currently not compatible. You have to pull some games to uh, actually be able to use that on there. But it does work, and on Android, the back button is the device's back button. You don't have a button labeled back. And many of the options that you need to get into that to do the saves and stuff like that are hidden under the menu button so like with almost anything on Android you do have to hit the menu button and see what's under there so I wanna say it's still there you may have to uh, to uh, poke around a little bit more but it's really great you don't need that data in the field or even a geocaching.com premium membership now, if you have uh, any questions, uh, some feedback, or a topic you'd like us to discuss on one of our randomized episodes, please call those in to 206-350-3647. We also love getting email at geogearheads at cashmaniacs.com, and you can send us audio files there as well. For a really quick reply, drop us a note through any of our social media accounts, and those are most easily found on cashmaniacs.com. But now it's time to get into our uh, topic of the day, which is gadget caches with our guest, WV Tim. Welcome to the show, Tim. Hey, thanks, guys, for having me. It's our pleasure for getting you on, but can you get, uh, give us a, just a kind of brief example of what a gadget cache is or what gadget cache really means? Well, what I, I use the term gadget cache where it's a cache where you have to do something to find the log. Sometimes it might be a mechanical device or maybe it's an object that is interesting for its ingenuity or novelty, but a lot of my caches you can see a hundred yards away and it's, it's uh, not hard to find the cache, but now sometimes it's hard to get uh, in the cache and find the log. 
That makes a lot of sense. Uh, so, as you said, the caches are easy to find, but difficult to solve. So, um, give me an example. What I'm looking at here is, uh, I believe the name is Gadget Cache. Yeah, Gadget Cache is a um, it, is really a simple cache, um, but it uses it uses smells. Um, and you actually have to identify different smells to find the coordinates to get to the next stage. In fact, Gadget Cache is actually on a bike trail here in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. And um, the first stage is actually just a uh, one-inch PVC pipe with a, a half-inch bolt and a spring rig to it. And uh, it might be two feet long. And um, when you walk up to that, you see it, you pull the spring back, and it actually shoots the micro out that's painted orange. You find that. It takes you to the second stage, which is uh, the, the heart of this ca cache, and it's actually a, um, a wooden blank. It's a, a blank of wooden wood with six holes, and I actually have six different Scents. And you have to identify the scent, and by identifying the scent, it has a number on top of the mm -hmm. lid. And so I have scents like raspberry and cinnamon and clove and strawberry, peppermint, and wintergreen. And so it's real simple. It sounds simple, but what happens? I, I think when we've started testing the cash, first couple smells you smell, it's pretty easy. But boy, mm -hmm. about smell three or four. They all kind of start running together. Yeah, yeah that would uh, right. definitely be an issue I could uh, foresee having. Yeah, and my concern was uh, trying to maintain something that has these uh, smells to them. And I couldn't even figure out uh, when I first thought of uh, this kind of uh, uh, puzzle how to make this a durable uh, container or durable uh, puzzle, but you seem to have uh, figured out a way to that it's actually lasted quite a while. Yeah, you know, when I first did it, I, I, I thought to myself, you know, there's no way of testing it until you really get it in the field. Now, we tested mm -hmm. it with all my muggle friends and making sure that the scents were correct and, and that it would work. But I thought, well, when it gets out in the field, people are going to change the lids. They're going to change the numbers. Um or the scents wouldn't last that long. But it has really surprised me. Uh, that cache now has been out 12 months this month, and I have had not had to do one single bit of maintenance on that cache. Now, what I did, I actually went to um, a pharmacy, and I bought these scents. And I think I, and I told you what they were, raspberry, cinnamon, cloves, strawberry, and peppermint, and wintergreen. And I just didn't want to put the scents. I, I bought six little vials and um, so that people wouldn't switch the, the smells, I color-coded both the vial and the lid and then color-coded the same number on top. So the uh, red vial, for example, might be cinnamon. So the vial is red. The top on the on the outside is red, and the number on the top, which is the coordinate where I want them to go, mm -hmm. it's red. And cashers have been great. Uh, nobody has tried to play any dirty tricks and change the lids. And um, it's really it's maintained its scent even after 12 months. Now, one of the things I did, I actually took a white, um, like an old cotton shirt. And I cut little teeny pieces of clean cotton, and I placed it in the vial before I added the scents, just in case someone would pour or drop mm -hmm. the, um, you know, the little vial, and the scent would run out. So the scent actually is permeated not only in the vial, but it's also on the, um, on the little teeny piece of cloth. And 12 months later, absolutely no maintenance. And the kids love it. <laughs> they just love it. And the only thing you've got to do is you've got to make sure you don't ever touch one of those valves to your nose because I've done that. And you get back on your bike and you're heading down the bike trail. And so for the next half hour, whatever you touch to your nose, you're going to smell it. <laughs> I can imagine. That's funny.
Now, having the smells out there, obviously it's, it's worked out well. I would think it would attract animals. You know, we, I haven't had a bit of problem. I, I bought little teeny vials. They're about the size of a micro. Uh, they're actually plastic uh, with plastic tops, and I put them on nice and tight. And then I um, actually made a, a little wooden piece of wood that, with the six holes, and I set them down in that, and I made it to fit into a ground speak uh, lock and lock Tupperware. Mm-hmm. And so um, I haven't had any animal problems, and it is near the woods. And so um, it's it's actually surprised me. I actually thought, you know, I'm going to try this in ex- as an experiment because mm-hmm. on a lot of gadget caches, you can expect to do maintenance. Because right. if you have a cache that you have to do something, that means you've got moving parts, you know, some of my caches, you have to pull something, push something, you know, blow up a balloon, uh, you know, move a lever, you know, push in a button. And so a, a lot of caches, you know, can cause a lot of maintenance. So I spend a lot of time in my shop testing and testing and retesting to try to make these caches as durable as possible as I possibly can. Incredible. Yeah, that is a big part mm-hmm. of it is making sure that these are uh, caches that can be done and are going to last for a little while because nothing would suck more than putting up a cache like this only to have it uh, destroyed within you know a week or so and no one really gets a chance to do it. Yeah, and I think on some of mine, a, a lot of my gadget caches, I'm not going to tell you that um, you know I've really you know solved the problem. I, I think several of my caches. I, I test and test, and I have some muggle neighbors, and I bring them over, and I'm sitting in my workshop, and they go, oh, this is another one of those gadgets or gadgets that I'm supposed to try to figure out how to get in. And I said, there it is. Go at it. And I actually let people try to break it um, to do whatever they can. But you know what? As much as you test a gadget cache, as soon as you put it in the field, you learn something. And mm-hmm. so a lot of times um, bringing them back in, I do a few tweaks, um, but I've, but I've kind of got several of mine down now that they're fairly maintenance free. No, that's good to hear. And a lot of these ideas aren't your ideas exclusively. There's ideas that uh, you've been inspired by someone else or you've worked with someone else to come up with. And another one that we wanted to talk about uh, was one that actually was an idea that came from a, a caching buddy of yours but who goes by uh, Dayspring. And apparently the two of you share ideas a lot, but this one really looked cool because uh, it actually rises the cache out of the lake. Yeah, this is a day spring idea, and um, any caches, especially in the uh, on the west coast side, has heard the name day spring, and I'm, I really call him a friend. And we started uh, by email correspondence, and then we went to telephone, and now he's a pilot. And um, when he's over on this side of the United States, we hooked up again a couple months ago, and uh, dinner is just napkin after napkin of drawing pictures. And so <laughs> you have to hear from Dayspring. But the cute thing about this cache is Dayspring was actually making a presentation on geocaching to a science class. Uh, a high school class, and uh, so he challenged them. He said, and he told him about some of his caches, and he said, okay, I want you guys to try to break up in groups, and I want you to come up with the next great cache idea. So a class of, of science muggle high school students came up with the idea that was the start of what I now call, my cache is called Up Periscope. And uh, it's actually a West Virginia Tim uh, Day Spring collaborated cache. And so Day Spring, um, during dinner one night, he draws it out on the napkin. And he says, I haven't got this working yet, but I've got this great idea. And he said, I want to put a cache in a lake, connect it to a dock, and maybe 20 feet away, 30, whatever you feel comfortable, I want to put a bicycle um I want to put a valve. So when you pull up to when you pull up to up Periscope and you're following your GPS, your GPS is just going to when it takes you to ground zero, you're then going to start looking for a um, just like a bike valve. 
And my cash page tells cashers that they will need to bring a bike pump. So you hook up your pump to the bike valve. You have no idea what to expect. Well, you kind of expect it because actually the cash is called up Periscope, and I have a picture of a Periscope on my cash page. So you start pumping, and then over, you know, 20 feet from you in the lake, you can hear gurgle, gurgle, gurgle. (laughs) And up out of the lake rises a – it's a a one-and-a-half-inch pipe inside a two-inch pipe, and it just – slides up and down and the one and a half inch pipe has a 90 degree elbow on the top of it and so you start pumping your bike pump and you start hearing noise nearby and you look and up out of the lake comes the periscope and that's actually an idea that was generated by this science class that day spring was teaching well it really sounds like a lot of fun you know uh, this just seems like one of those things that would be really tough to actually implement too. So how did you go about getting approval to get something like that installed somewhere? Well, I went to the um, the parks and recreation people here in the Panhandle of West Virginia love geocaching, and uh, I've developed a relationship with them. Um, and so I went to the director of the Parks and Recreation, and I told him all about my cash. And I said, now, I'm going to put a piece – I have to put a piece of PVC, and it's going to be under the water. And it will be under the water about you know over a foot or so, so you won't be able to see it. And I told him all about it, and he goes, oh, I'd love for you to do it. So we did it with permission. Um, the interesting thing about this cash show is when the idea first came up in this science class, and Day Spring started thinking, he was talking to the class, and he said, well, you pump it up and it comes up. Well, that works out great, but now how do you put the cash back? Because mm-hmm. when you put the cash back, uh, well, the other thing, to put the cash back, what we did, we came up with the idea of drawing uh, with fluorescent paint the top of the two-inch pipe, the very mouth of it. We just painted a little circle with fluorescent pipe. So after the cash is, comes up, you reach down and grab it. You pull it the rest of the way out of the lake. Um, there is a waterproof matchbox container that's glued up in the 90-degree angle. And uh, But when you put it back, you, just, you can see just an orange ring, and it allows you to put the cash back. I actually thought that one would end up in the bottom of the lake, uh, but now it's only been out a couple months, and it's a little off the beaten trail. So it hasn't had hundreds of visits yet, but um, had very little maintenance problems with that. But now here's the interesting thing. You haven't asked the right question yet. How in the world does that thing go down? That was my question. Because unless there's a – well, good. So if, unless there's a hole in the top mm-hmm. of that container, mm-hmm. it doesn't allow the air to go out, and the cash just sits there. So when it came up in science class, I think Dave Springs told me so my first reaction was, that's a great idea, but you, only the first person would be mm-hmm. able to claim the cash because when you put it back, it's just going to sit there because it's going to trap the air. So I, he told him to go back to the drawing board. Well, the, the class actually came up with the idea and the solution. They said drill a small hole in the top of the plastic to allow the air out so when you put it back, the air will go down. But the hole can't be big enough that – it is, I guess I should say it's got to be small enough that even when you start pumping, it will allow the cash to come up out of the lake. And so it releases air because the, around it because the one-and-a-half-inch one pipe inside a two-inch pipe kind of bleeds air around the outside, mm-hmm. but it also bleeds air out of the top. But the bike pump puts so much air into the pipe that the pipe, even though it's going gurgle, 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 bubble, 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 it still raises. And so when you put it back, it just sits there. And at first, when the cash is out of the water, you just hear, <sighs> but then as it hits the water, you see the bubbles and it, you know, start coming, and the cash just drops right back in its original location. So I assume you need a boat to go out and get this since you said it was 20 feet out. Is that correct? It's 20 feet off. It's on the dock, but you have to actually attach it. Well, the way we did it, we actually attached it to the dock, but not at ground zero. 
because uh, from ground zero, you have your bike pump, uh, not your bike pump, you have your bike valve, valve. that attaches mm -hmm. to a piece of plastic tube that you can buy at a Lowe's or you know Home Depot. I just made that tube about 20 feet long, okay. and I hid the plastic tube under the dock to come to another location in the dock. And, of course, you, you have to think through this because you can't have your dock where your boards are in, you know, overhang out over the wood. So mm -hmm. I actually attached it on the side of a six by six. And so you can hear it gurgling and it comes up and you can just walk right over to another location in the dock and pick up pick up the cache. Just as mm -hmm. cute it's just as cute as can be. It's another cache that both adults uh as well as kids just love because it does something, and ca that's why I just love gadget caches. Uh, I mean, because if a cache does something, it's so much. It adds just a whole another um, element to the hunt. You know, not only are you finding it, but then it's doing something. It's moving, mm -hmm. or you've got to solve something. So, a periscope. Um, I actually practiced it. I have a, a little farm pond, and uh, so I had to crawl in my farm pond. You know, two or three times, I have my wife up on the top of the dock, and to get that hole in the top just right so it worked perfectly, it took two or three, you know, practice runs before mm -hmm. I did it. And then when I did it, I just said, I told my wife, I said, this cache is not going to last a week. Somebody's going to be putting it back, miss the yes. two inch pipe, and it's going to end up in the bottom of the lake. So I made like three of them, but so far, um, it's lasted. Now, it's only been out for a couple months. And, then, of course, here in West Virginia, uh, in the next two or three months, it's going to freeze over. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have a hard time trying to capture that uh, cache when the pond freezes over. You're going to have to have a lot of air pressure to pump that up through a couple inches of ice. <laughs> yeah, we will. <laughs> we? Yeah, this is going to be a summertime cache problem. <laughs> I think you're right. Now, yeah, up where you guys are from, it's going to, you know, um, it, it, it would be hard on Lake Michigan to have a cache like this. Yes. So how did you get into making these more involved cache hides? Well, I think I probably started like anyone. Um, you know, I started with the uh, very, um, you know, simple caches that, you know, with um, lock and locks and ammo cans. And then... Um, I had a there was a cashier here in the area named Snurt, and um, he I found a couple of his caches, and they weren't the typical caches. And I thought, well, what do I got to do? And at the time, I hadn't thought about building unusual things, so I just started shopping at dollar stores and Tractor Supply, and I found rats and grasshoppers and crickets and. Um, I found a turkey head that was a hitch cover that goes on the back of a truck, and I found a deer and a cow. And all I did was start drilling holes in these animals. So those were kind of my first, you know, take at an unusual cache. And the logs, people loved them because now instead of finding a piece of Tupperware under a rock, and there's not a thing wrong with that, we all cache for different reasons. Mm -hmm. But I love finding a cache and then when you, you know, you get it, you kind of go, wow, that was kind of different. That's fun. And um, most of us aren't into necessarily trading a lot of swag. Um, you know, a lot of us older guys are just really interested in the hunt and the unusual cash. And so I took a bunch of micros, attached them or drilled holes into maybe a um, – a large deer head or something and hid the deer head in the uh, tree and called it, um, you know, called it wild deer or something. And so a lot of times people know what my caches are going to be because I'll, it'll be called moo or cricket or grasshopper. But you know what? They come up to a tree and they start looking around and all of a sudden there's a cricket attached to a tree with a micro stick and, you know, with a hole drilled in it with a micro container. Gives them something to talk about for you for a few minutes. So I kind of started that way, and then I actually came up with one original idea. I'm kind of a half of a carpenter. So I started with a bluebird house one day in my shop, and I said, what can I do with this bluebird house to make it an unusual cache? And so I made uh, a cache that I call high-tech. It just now broke in. It's now the number three cache in the state of Virginia. Wow. Uh, with wow. over 100 votes. 
And it, the thing that makes this cash so great, and I love it, is it's so simple. And I made it out of barn wood. So it's another one of those caches that hundreds of people see a day because they look over and they see a, a gray collared bluebird house. But the thing that makes high tech a little bit unusual, you walk up and you look at the high tech, the cache, and it looks like you think you have to ask yourself, is this the geocache? Um, and um, you know, there's nothing there that tells you it's a geocache. But when you push in the perch, out of the bottom drops a micro, and um, it's a very simple cache. It's easy to make. Mm -hmm. uh, it hides easily because you can place it in a public place. Now you got to put, put a piece of um, uh, plexiglass over top of that um, birdhouse so you don't have a bird moving into your geocache. But uh, high tech has just been – it was one of my first gadget caches. And um, it's a real easy design. I just went below the, um, the bird opening and I actually attached a hinge – onto a piece of wood, kind of making a flap. Well, when you push the perch in, in a true bird, a bluebird house, in case some of you are listeners hear that, and they'll say bluebird houses don't have perches. That's true. So I attached the perch, and uh, it's just a half-inch hole with a half-inch dowel. Mm -hmm. but when you push the dowel in, it moves a wooden door, kind of a flap that raises up, that has a piece of uh, fishing line on it that goes up to the top with a little bolt, and then it goes down. I have a piece of plumbing pipe uh, drilled in the back of the um, birdhouse, and all it does is allow the cache a place to travel. So the mm -hmm. cache, the little micro, goes up and down this little half-inch plumbing pipe. So when you push in the perch, boom, about four or five inches below the bottom of that cache, bang, a micro just drops out. And then I took black paint and just barely, barely kind of lightly painted the black, the bottom of the bluebird house dark. And almost everyone walks up to the cache and doesn't see that little half-inch hole. And they just sit there and fiddle with it. And I think the cache page says, figure out my secret, and the cache will, you know, will present itself. And they push in the perch, and boom. Down comes that, you know, pushes the flap that has the string that drops the micro, and that's high tech. Has now over 100 votes, and it's number, it just got the number three in Virginia. And of course, it's, I live in West Virginia, so it's my only Virginia cache. Nice. Nice. Yeah, those uh, birdhouse caches do seem to be the ones that uh, most of the people who have. Uh, kind of given us some feedback for the show seem to really like the best and you know, certainly not the only ones you've done and you've done a few uh, different versions of the birdhouse but this is the one that you thought would be probably the easiest uh, for our uh, listeners at home to replicate yeah because you know what all you're really doing it, it, i actually just printed offline the uh, birdhouse plants a bluebird i mean from the uh, you know the audubon society it's the typical bluebird house and I had some old wood, and uh, that worked out great, but you don't have to use old wood. But I used old wood, and um, the thing that makes high tech so, I think, so much fun is it's so simple. And um, I like to kind of parlay that cat. I, I like sending people that email me and say, I really like to do something unusual in my area. I'm all up for sending them, you know, pictures of the inside of my cash because I really love trading ideas because I'll be honest with you, I'm not very smart. It's guys like Dayspring and other people that kind of motivate me. So if we can motivate some other, you know, um, geocachers around the United States to create some of these gadget caches, I think it makes it more fun for all of us. So now you're willing to share your designs with people around the country and even around the world. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to be honest with you, uh, a lot of my ideas, you know, um, are you know came from guys like Dayspring and others. Uh, I've got a mousetrap cache that come from a cacher down in North Carolina. Uh, always after I after I find an interesting cache, um, since high tech was my very first original gadget that was kind of my own design, um, 
I will come back after finding a really cool uh, cache. The one in North Carolina, I think, was called All Rats. So I wrote the cache owner, and I said, hey, I got a really good gadget cache. Would you like to trade? And, um, you know, I have never been told no. And uh, I trade ideas all the time. Nice. I love trading. But even if I got somebody who doesn't, doesn't you know, have a, a really cool idea and they just want to see – pictures of the inside of my cache, I'd be more than happy to send them a picture. I mean, that's what we're really trying to do here, isn't it, is kind yep. of create some interesting some interesting caches. Yeah. And I use that, um, I've kind of, I've used <laughs> that birdhouse design to make probably five, six, seven, eight different gadget caches. I have caches that you got to push and pull and slide, and some of them you almost need two hands to do things at the same time. I've got a cache that um, actually you find a, in one location, you find a balloon, and you have to use the balloon to, you know, to open another door someplace else on the cache, and that's the fun thing because I love getting calls from cashers and they go, I'm out at your cache and I'm having a hard time. And yep, uh, yep, yep. It, one of the caches is painted bright red and it's at a fire department and you can see it for a hundred yards away. And I go, you're having trouble finding it. <laughs> they go, no, it's really funny. You know, no, I'm not having trouble finding it. I can't figure out how to sign the log. <laughs> <laughs> and so that kind of makes it fun. You know, that's what makes it fun. Exactly. Tim, thank you so much for being on the show. This was a, a really fun show for me. Now, join us next week for Jeepin' in Idaho on equipment for geocaching by off-road vehicles. You can watch us live through the Google Plus Hangout on air or through YouTube. As always, that and all of our audio shows are available from the website or through the podcast feed. Check the Cashamaniacs website at cashamaniacs.com for more on the Geo Gearheads, including show notes from this and all our episodes. We love hearing from our listeners, so leave us feedback by calling 206 350 3647, by emailing geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com, or through social media. Your support helps keep the, G the Cashamaniac shows coming. Please consider making a PayPal donation through the link on our website to support the Cashamaniac shows. Geo Gearheads is produced by Chris Umfenauer and Daryl Wattenberg. This show is copyright 2012 by Daryl Wattenberg. All rights reserved. Guess we're the Cashamaniacs.